Okay, I think that's 8 o'clock. So our first speaker this morning is Dr. Ranilovich from the Pediatric Neurology Service. She'll be giving us um, a great talk, and then that will be followed by Dr. Degree, who will be talking about some projects that we have going on around here at the Moran, um, mainly the library. So um, without further ado, uh, Dr. Ranilovich. Hi there, can you hear me all right? Great. So um, as your colleague mentioned, I'm from pediatric neurology, but uh, did have a recent neuro-ophthalmology rotation in which I saw a patient I'll be discussing today with Dr. Judith Warner. Um, I have very few disclosures. This patient was a 51-year-old woman who had been referred uh, by neurology to neuro-ophthalmology because of some abnormal eye movements that they had observed um, and also developing double vision. Um, she did develop uh, dizziness first in August of 2013, um, and since then had been diagnosed with migraines because of having um, some light sensitivity, sound sensitivity, and nausea with these. Um, no medications that she had trialed had been very effective, neither had violence and hearing therapy. Um, then she started to have some double vision. Uh, this developed in the fall of 2015 and kind of came on to her gradually. The two images were always separated vertically, but sometimes there was a, a lesser horizontal component in their separation. Um, it was binocular and improved with patching of one eye. Um, she was having frequent falls by the time that we saw her and did require a walking stick and found um, going downstairs particularly difficult. More alarmingly, for about a one month period in April of this year, she had difficulty talking. She could express herself by writing, um, and her husband had noted that she had some intermittent left arm shaking during this period as well. Uh, she had already had some workup um, through neurology. So um, first, when she developed her persistent dizziness, was seen by audiology, diagnosed with just some mild hearing loss, um, was seen uh, by an otolaryngologist as well when her symptoms started, um, and they did note down beating nystagmus indicated a possible um, central uh, you know, contribution to her pathology. So she was referred to neurology. They performed a lumbar puncture and MRI, which were reassuring, as well as some other serum tests. The only abnormality they noted was uh, slightly elevated um, thyroid studies. Um, her past medical history um, is notable for some um, psychiatric uh, disease, including um, quite serious depression with a history of suicide attempt. Um, she has used glasses for driving for the last two years um, and has had uh, perhaps a concussion. Um, she did have headaches uh, prior to 2013, which were non migratus in character. And then family history is significant for some headache history, as well as um, some cancer and autoimmune. So her exam, um, she did have normal um, corrected visual acuity. Um, no afferent uh, pupillary defect. Um, her visual fields were subjectively a little decreased. I think it was on the left, um, but they were full to finger counting. And her motility was full in range, but this is where um, her exam was the most abnormal. She had an alternating skew, um, also saccadic downward pursuit, um, downbeat nystagmus in right gaze and down gaze, and left beat nystagmus in left gaze and upbeat in up gaze. Um, anterior segments slightly abnormal with um, uh, regularity of the left pupil margin, and intraocular pressures and dilated of fundus examination were fine. So um, for those of you who haven't encountered SKU deviation before, I've provided a kind of image of what it looks like. Essentially, when patients look to the right, they have a right eye hypertropia. In primary gaze, they look fairly normal. And then in left gaze, they have a left eye hypertropia. Um, and uh, it you know, they kind of refer to it here as a vertical misalignment caused by damage to prenuclear vestibular input, but don't get fixated on this idea that it has something to do with the inner ear, um, because that word vestibular can be um, resulting from a lesion in the cerebellum, um, brainstem, superior colliculi, those sorts of areas. Um, it can be differentiated on exam from a bilateral fourth nerve palsy. Um, in that, you have a right eye hypertropia in left gaze and a left eye hypertropia in right gaze. Um, so after examining this patient, um, Dr. Warner, who I was working with, was um, most concerned for cerebellar pathology, but as I noted, the MRI was normal. Um, this can occur in certain antibody-mediated diseases, you know, especially uh, early on in the disease before there's cerebellar atrophy. So she was tested for perineoplastic antibodies, GAD65, and gliadin antibodies. 
Um, episodic ataxia was considered, but her um, symptoms hadn't really been that episodic. We did suggest that a trial of Dialox um, could be considered by her primary care doctor. And then this subjective visual field deficit she had was difficult to evaluate because she didn't have her glasses with her. So we asked her to fill a new prescription for um, uh, her myopia and return in six weeks to test her um, visual fields and perhaps to make a trial of prisms as well. Um, and then prescribe vestibular therapy as she'd been having a great number of falls. And then her results came back, um, very positive for GAD65 antibodies. Um, her gliadin antibodies and Mayo Pierre neoplastic panel were negative. So uh, GAD65 antibodies uh, can present in a number of ways. They've been associated uh, quite strongly with stiff person syndrome, probably uh, the initial disorder um, in which they were um, reported to be associated. Um, Insulin-dependent diabetes, though in lower titers typically. Um, progressive encephalomyelitis with rigidity and myoclonus, or PERM. Uh, cerebellar ataxia, um, which this patient certainly was exhibiting. Encephalitis, questionably also present in this patient epilepsy, and some patients have uh, elements of uh, multiple of these. Um, it is an ophthalmologic disease um, with reported associations including the cerebellar signs found in this patient, um, hypometric saccades, and then I've also seen a patient with PERM who had terrible ophthalmoplegia as well. Um, the epidemiology of GAD-related cerebellar ataxia in particular um, is highly uh, female predominant. The average age of onset is somewhere in the, the middle years, and half of these patients have type 1 diabetes as well. Um, the antibodies can be sent out to Mayo or here to AREP, um, and typically the titers will be higher than those found in type 1 diabetes. Um, and often these patients have antibodies to other uh, endocrine tissues. Occasionally the etiology can be perineoplastic. Uh, the pathophysiology is that these antibodies uh, attack the presynaptic nerve terminals around the cerebellar Purkinje cells, um, and GAD um, is uh, an enzyme that synthesizes GABA from glutamate. Uh, patient symptoms that can be a clue when you're interviewing folks for which you're considering this diagnosis include double vision, difficulty walking, stiffness, personality changes, diabetes, and other rheumatologic diagnoses. Uh, the treatment, um, there, there haven't been a huge number of cases reported of this, um, and response has been quite variable, but generally immunosuppression is the main treatment for um, the you know, underlying disorder. There is one case report of uh, periodic alternating nystagmus responding to baclofen. And again, if you think about a disorder of GABA production, a GABAergic drug such as baclofen etiologically makes some sense. Um, so the patient was referred on to neuroimmunology once this diagnosis was made, and uh, their impression was that her condition was highly consistent with GAD65-related progressive cerebellar dysfunction. Um, they uh, invoked some other things like her increased anxiety and startle response as well, um, and recommended treatment. And in fact, when I spoke to this uh, attending who had seen her yesterday in clinic, um, she mentioned that they were planning to proceed very aggressively with plasmapheresis. Uh, her anxiety they recommended treating with Valium. So uh, further results, they sent out for GAD65 to get a precise titer to track over time in response to immunotherapy uh, to Mayo. Um, and then she also had an elevated hemoglobin A1C, so perhaps working her way towards type 1 diabetes. And then her thyroid is much more elevated now than it was a few years ago. Um, they also sent for glycine receptor antibodies because these can present in a very similar fashion, particularly with respect to the cerebellar findings. Um, so these are my references for the presentation, and I uh, will welcome any questions at this time. When, when yes. should we order antibodies for GAD65? Um, I think if you have, um, as in this case, uh, some abnormalities of uh, eye movement that could be best characterized as cerebellar, rather than um, you know, being attributable to any of the cranial nerves, and certainly um, either just isolated cerebellar atrophy or a normal cerebellum on MR imaging, um, that antibodies should be considered, especially if you have any clues such as these associated symptoms, like um, the, uh, you know, maybe stiffness in the back or um, already diagnosed diabetes. Other questions? All right, thank you.